This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello, everyone. The worldly church system is full of pretenders. Those who think that they will enter the kingdom of God by their own self-declarations. But no one will enter the kingdom of God except those who do the will of the Father the will of God. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, because he who has suffered in the flesh has seized from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. The will of God do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away and its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides to the age. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Lord, 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 did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles? This is very confusing to those in the worldly church system. The natural man cannot comprehend the things of God. These Lord, Lord people confess Jesus as Lord. To the worldly church system, that sounds pretty good. These Lord, Lord people prophesied. To the worldly church system, that seems very good. These Lord, Lord people cast out demons. To worldly churchianity, that seems very good. These Lord, Lord people did miracles. To those in the worldly church system who still belong to the world, that sounds very, very good. In fact, those in the worldly church system would regard such people who do these things as super Christians. But Jesus tells them they are workers of lawlessness. What? This just sends those in worldly churchianity 
into a complete tailspin. And that in itself demonstrates their own self-deception. These Lord, Lord people confess Jesus as Lord. And they did all these kinds of things, which the apostles of Jesus did. And then Jesus rejects them without hesitation, sends them away, and calls them workers of wickedness. What? Didn't Paul say that if you confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved? Isn't that what these people are doing? Lord, Lord. Didn't Paul say that no one can confess Jesus as Lord except by the Spirit? And most in the worldly church system think to themselves, we can't prophesy, we don't cast out demons, we don't do miracles, but these guys did. What's the problem? Why are they rejected? What? And Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who do lawlessness? What? How strange this sounds to those in churchianity. Because if they did these things, it sure seems like they did the will of the Father. The people in the worldly church system cannot comprehend what is happening here because they are doing the very same thing as these Lord, Lord people, and they don't see the problem with it. In the worldly church system, you are the decider of what you do, not the Lord. You read your Bible, and then you decide how to carry out what Jesus taught. You decide what you will do, and you decide when you will do it, and you decide how you will do it. You are the master of these plans. What you will do, how you will do it, and when you will do it. You create your own custom design agenda rather than doing the Lord's, so that what you do fits into your own custom design life plan, your own personal agenda, which suits your own personal aspirations. And in the worldly church system, they just cannot fathom why that would be a problem. Jesus says, I never knew you because he had nothing to do with these people and these works they are citing. The problem with these Lord, Lord characters is that they were doing their own will by their own design instead of the Father's will. And they are so deluded that they don't even know the difference. These Lord, Lord people were doing what they deemed to be the good works of God by acts of their own will rather than God's. And that's exactly how it is done out there in worldly churchianity. You decide what it is you are going to do for the Lord. You decide when you will do it. You decide how you will do it, and so on. And so it's all ultimately by your own design and your own agenda, all by your own will, rather than the will of God. Fake Christianity. Pretenders disguising themselves as messengers of light. They said, Lord, Lord. In the worldly church system, confessing Jesus as Lord is routinely nothing more than empty, meaningless lip service. But to confess Jesus as Lord really means 
He is the Lord who has authority over you. You are his obedient servant, and you are submitting to him as his servant to do what he says and obey him. That's what it really means to confess Jesus as Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do what I say. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Obedient servants do what their master or Lord says. If you do not do what he says, you are defiantly disobedient and rebelling against him. He who does the will of my Father. Therefore, what do you think that word therefore is there for? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and it did not fall. For it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. What words is he talking about? Everyone who hears these words words of mine. What words is Jesus talking about? Well, notice how he ends this, or how this account ends. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as having authority and not as their scribes. These are the concluding words to the Sermon on the Mount, which began in verse 1 of chapter 5. These words of mine, the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And Jesus taught them a whole bunch of things. And when it was all done, it says, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as having authority and not as their scribes. And it's important to remember what Jesus said. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. These are the Father's words which he is speaking. It is the Father's teaching. As Jesus said at John 14, 24, My words are not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So when he says the will of my Father and these words of mine, these words of mine are the will of the Father. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Now we know that these words of mine are everything he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And we also know his teaching was not his own, but the Father's. So doing these things is the will of the Father, and no one will enter the kingdom except he who does the will of the Father. And what is that? All these things that Jesus had just taught them. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, and does them, only those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom. 
that is, those who do everything which Jesus had just taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And whoever does not do them is a fool, a fool who builds his house upon the sand. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And that's Luke's parallel account. Do you see his point? If you call him Lord, but you do not obediently do what he says, your words are nothing but dishonest, meaningless, empty lip service. To confess him as Lord means you obediently submit to doing what he says as his servant, as an obedient servant of your Lord. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door for many. I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. In other words, I don't know you, man. Who are you? Where are you from? I don't know you. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Many. And that's why Jesus goes on to say in this same teaching, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Yes, only a few will be saved. Most of those in the worldly church system eagerly choose the broad and easy road, which leads to destruction. They want to take the broad road and not the narrow and difficult road, which leads to life. And they delude themselves into thinking that's going to work for them. As such, they will say with their lips, Lord, Lord. But Jesus will not know them on that day because they are really doing everything they do by an act of their own will, rather than the will of the Father. Well, what should we do for Jesus today? Sorry, but that would amount to your will, not his. It is not those who decide by an act of their own will what they will do for God or Jesus and when and how they will do it according to their own agendas. But those who rather respond to the will of God, being led by his Holy Spirit, he leads, we follow, not the other way around. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
to yield up your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. On that day, Jesus will know these people, those who surrender up themselves to God, to do whatever he wants to do with them, when he wants and how he wants. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, not those who act according to their own will and led by their own agendas and their own design. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name do many miracles? These things are highly esteemed among men of the worldly church system. They're very impressed by it, but this does not impress God. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. False prophets who prophesy. That's why they're called false prophets. They prophesy in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They do miracles in his name. And Jesus tells them, you who work lawlessness, bad trees who bear bad fruit. The way is broad that leads to destruction. Beware of the false prophets. Many are on that road. Those who work lawlessness. Notice the contrast here. Not everyone who claims to be a believer, a follower of Jesus, is a true believer and a true follower of Jesus. There are many fakers, many pretenders, many false believers, many false Christians, in their fake church system, if you claim to be a Christian, then you are. And pretenders know how to say, Lord, Lord, in your name, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we did miracles in your name. And those in the world church system Whatever they do, all they think they need to do is say, Lord, Lord, we do these things in your name, and then it is so. There are many who claim to be doing things in his name. In the worldly church system, if you claim to be a Christian, then you are. And if you claim to be doing things in his name, then it is so. Why? because you said so. It is your will that it be so, therefore it is so. Is that the will of the Father? Many false prophets, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many, for false anointed ones and false 
prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, also the chosen ones. Behold, I have told you in advance. Pay attention to what Jesus said. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Go away from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. Do you think that might be the will of the Father? Jesus not deciding to do things by an act of his own will, but doing the will of the Father. Miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him, the will of the Father. And so it is with all the children of God. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Works which you prepare for God? No. That's what the Lord, Lord people do. These are works which God prepared for you to do. It is these who are doing the will of the Father, not those who prepare their own good works to do in the name of Jesus, as those in the worldly church system do, but those who are led by the Spirit of God to do His works, which He prepares for them to do. And again, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Why would anyone be glorifying the Father because of your good works? Jesus was the light of the world, and all the children of God are the light of the world. The Father, who is light, was abiding in Jesus, doing the works. He said so. And the Father is abiding in all the children of God, doing his works in the same way. God the Father is light, the light that was in Jesus and the same light that is in all the children of God who walk just as Jesus walked. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name do many miracles unless you see signs and wonders? You will not believe. The world likes an entertaining show and they want to be entertained. They want to hear a good sermon. Yay! They want to hear good music they like. Yay! And they want to be told whatever it is they want to hear. They like an entertaining show.
an entertaining sermon by an entertaining preacher, and even more entertaining, a signs and wonders show. Things which impress worldly men fit for the applause and approval of men and glory of men instead of things which are the will of the Father and the approval of the Father and the glory of the Father. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Does our God and Father need to impress you and please you first before you will love him and do what is pleasing to him? God is love, my friend. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophecy, and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing, nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The worldly church system cannot comprehend why these impressive displays of power were not satisfying to God, since they love to feed on these things highly esteemed among the men in their church. But what is highly esteemed among men is detestable to God. God is love. God would rather find you in a downtown back alley feeding a homeless, downtrodden soul and loving him without any fanfare or approval of men or applause or anything of the sort rather than doing all these miracles which impress men. That's what God cares about. God is love. Many will say to me on that day, many, Lord, Lord, and they will be rejected by Jesus. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. These Lord, Lord people are fake Christians putting on a show. The fake anointed ones Jesus warned about who would do signs and wonders in his name. And their Lord, Lord lip service did them no good on that day because they did not actually do what Jesus taught. They were doing their own thing in the name of Christ rather than God's will. Jesus is teaching his disciples to walk in God's love, doing his will, the righteousness of God. These particular people conjured up their own show, and the Lord had absolutely nothing to do with it. Go away from me. I never knew you. The worldly church system implicitly teaches their flock in various ways that it's all up to them how they custom design their own walk with Jesus. They decide what good works they will do, when they will do them, and how they will do them, all according to their own agenda and their own schedule to make sure their own life aspirations are met. In the end, God nor his Son will have anything to do with their deeds. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. God decides what, when, and how. Only he who does the will of my Father. It's those who yield up their bodies as living sacrifices. 
those who surrender themselves up to God. Only these have the Spirit of God and are led by the Spirit of God, and only these are the sons of God. Jesus only said what the Father told him to say, and he only did what he saw the Father wanted to do. He told us so. He didn't go around supposing he should conjure up something to do for God today. He didn't decide what he shall do by himself and for himself for the Father. He offered himself up to God so that God would do whatever he wanted to do with Jesus. And we are to walk just as Jesus walked. And here's why the worldly people of the church system refuse to submit to God. This will certainly not suit their custom design personal agendas, will it? Fellowshipping in the sufferings of Christ and being conformed to his death. Enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Many will say, Lord, Lord. So the Lord, Lord fakers and pretenders choose to feed on their own lies, deceiving themselves into believing they can take the broad and easy road to eternal life. I did it my way instead of the way of Christ. The will of God for them today and tomorrow and whenever shall be whatever they decide for themselves to do in the name of God. And so they choose destruction for themselves. There is only one way to be saved, friend, the way of Christ. We must trust in God and his way of doing things rather than ourselves and our way by our own will. Jesus himself offered himself up to God, beginning at the Jordan River, surrendering himself completely to him and his will. Here I am, Father, do whatever you want with me. Jesus trusted in God's way for him, and having trusted in his God, being faithful to him to the end, Jesus was perfected and became the embodiment of God's way of doing things. Friends, this is the faith of Christ. In this way, he is the forerunner of the Christian faith, the author of the faith. And because he went ahead of us and blazed the way and walked the walk first, he is the firstborn of many brothers, all the begotten children of God who walk just as he walked. His way was his God's way, and God perfected him in this way. And so now if we do it Jesus' way, we will be doing it God's way, walking just as he walked, God's way. So like Jesus, we must walk as he walked and offer up ourselves, surrender up ourselves as living sacrifices for the rest of our lives to God as living sacrifices to him, set apart to God for him to do whatever he wants to do with us, trusting that whatever he does with us is far better than whatever we could do with ourselves. The narrow gate. Here I am, Father. Do what you will with me. Lead me by your Spirit into all righteousness. This is the faith of Christ, and there is no other way to be saved. The faith of Christ is to offer ourselves up to God just as Jesus did from the time he left the Jordan River. We put our faith in Jesus in this way, 
because he knows the way. He's been there, done that. And his way is God's way. And his way is the faith of Christ. To completely surrender ourselves to God. For God to do whatever he wants with us. Trusting that he will be faithful to us and bring us to his kingdom and glory. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what concord has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out of their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I shall be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Is there someone in your life for whom you are concerned? A friend? Perhaps it's your spouse. Maybe it's a grown child who is not living up to all the light he or she knows. If you would like to learn more about the science of intercessory prayer, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Your prayers can be blessed to the salvation of others. Through prayer, you can cooperate with heavenly agencies to be a blessing to everyone with whom you come in contact. To learn more, go to worldslastchance.com. Look for the article, Praying for Others. Read it today. Yahweh is waiting with longing to answer your prayers. Kelly Masala from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia has sent in a great question, Dave, for our daily mailbag, and it's something I've wondered about too. And he writes, Greetings, brothers, in the name of our wonderful Saviour, Yahushua. Could you please explain what it means to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? This confuses me. Well, that can be a confusing statement, and I'm really glad you asked, Bekele. Firstly, let's take a moment to clarify that salvation is a gift. It's not something we can earn by works. Scripture is very clear on this point. Miles, could you just read from the letter to Titus, uh, chapter 3, and it's verses 3 to 7. Titus, now Titus, it's, it's, um, it's a hard little book to find, actually. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> uh, but here we go, and we've got it here. It says, quote, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of Eloah our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Yahushua Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You can't get any clearer than this. We are not saved by works of righteousness which we have done. Instead, it is according to his mercy that we are saved. Therefore, when Paul says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, he must be referring to something else. So let's go ahead and read this in context. Could you just turn over to Philippians chapter 2 and then read us verse 12, please? Okay, I've got it. It says, 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, that's the text. But the word wherefore indicates that it's referring to something else that was just said. So let's just back up and read verses 9 through to 13. Wherefore Yah also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Yahushua every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yahushua Christ is Lord, to the glory of Yahuwah the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is Yah which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Unquote. And it looks like we've got another wherefore in there. <laughs> yes, that's right. Paul does this. His well-educated mind builds these long, complex arguments. Wherefore, because of this, therefore, that's the result. And that's what he's doing here. When you look at the context of what you've just read, you'll find that the chapter starts with another statement that refers back still further. Chapter 2 starts with the statement, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfil ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So the chapter itself starts with a if-therefore statement that refers back to the previous chapter. Yeah, this refers to a thought or statement expressed in chapter 1 that we must take into account. Now, we're not going to read it out on air. If you want, you can do this at home using your own Bible. But briefly, in the first chapter of his letter to the church at Philippi, Paul told them that he has always prayed joyfully for them for their fellowship in the gospel. In verse 6, he calls this fellowship in the gospel a good work and says that Yahweh began it in them and will continue to do this good work in them until the day they see Yahushua. This is the theme that continues throughout the rest of the chapter, this theme of fellowship based on love. Yeah, and I can see that Paul then goes on uh, and then share some of his hardships that he's encountered. Yes, and he happily notes that these hardships actually helped further the spread of the gospel. Then he adds that there is still a lot of work to be done and that all believers must strive together for the faith of the gospel and not be afraid of their enemies. Yeah, and I'm seeing here that he ends the chapter by saying that they're not just to believe on Yahushua, but to suffer for him as well. Yes, right. Now, this is the context that sets up Philippians chapter 2, where we find him telling them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. He's telling them that they should put certain principles in place so they can all work unitedly to spread the gospel. In verses 1 to 4 of chapter 2, Paul tells them that they must be of one mind and purpose and be willing to humble themselves for the sake of each other. Then in verses 5 to 11, he tells them they need to allow the mind of Yahushua to be in them. This will give them a servant's heart so that they can give their lives to the gospel just as Yahushua did. So to summarise then, Dave, Paul is saying that there is so much more work to be done. They all need to cooperate together and fully surrender themselves to the work of the gospel, just like Yahushua did. Am I getting this right? Yes. So with this context in mind, Paul then says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, that because of what Yahushua did to save them, they should in turn always be willing to obey the call of Yah to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he then goes on to explain that Yah himself Self is at work in them and has planted both the desire to do it and the strength as well because it pleases Yah. And it's for this reason, Paul explains, that they should all work together without squabbling and infighting so that they can be lights in the world and a shining example to unbelievers around them. So Philippians 2 verse 12 isn't about doing good works to earn our salvation at all. It, instead, it's, it's saying that because of the gift of salvation, we have been given both the desire and the power to do good works, which, of course, will be used to share the gospel with others. Yeah. Exactly. And to put it another way, Yahweh is telling us to work out or exercise our salvation. We're not to settle back at ease and let others take up the work of spreading the gospel. We're to do our part too. We're to exercise the desire and the power Yah has given us to save others. And we're to do this so that others will not suffer the same fate that we would have suffered if the grace of Yah hadn't saved us. 
It's all about putting our faith to work for the sake of helping others. Yah has planted in us the desire to save others. He's given us the power to do it as well. So don't just sit there. Get busy and go help others learn of salvation. So, so what does this look like in real life, this working out our own salvation? Well, Paul gives us the answer to that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. All right, can, can I just have a quick second to look that up? Of course. Okay. Uh, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine this is how we exercise our own salvation we put it to work by sharing the truth whenever we have an opening in our day-to-day -day lives to share truth or encourage to point someone to the savior to live out yah's forgiving love in our own lives we need to do it and when we do this we are cooperating with yah for the salvation of souls we are working out our own salvation yeah, and I think another way we can work out our own salvation or exercise our own salvation is being patient with others' failings, sharing the truths we know, seeking more truth so we can be doctrinally pure. Those are all ways we can put our salvation to work in spreading the gospel. And when we do this, just like someone who exercises his body faithfully, we will become stronger in our walk with Yah. We'll be able to do more, accomplish more for the salvation of others, and all because of our love and gratitude to the Father. We'll love much because we have been forgiven much, and we'll want to pass that on. Yes, exactly. Uh, that is putting our salvation to work for us, working out our own salvation. Now remember this, any time a single verse seems to contradict what multiple other passages of Scripture say, we have to look for an interpretation that is consistent with everything else. Truth is not contradictory. It can appear so if we don't understand it correctly, but truth itself is always consistent. When we look at the topic of salvation in Scripture, we quickly see that the Bible clearly teaches that salvation is a free gift. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Yah, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Precisely. So when viewed with all the other passages of Scripture, we can know that this one verse in Philippians 2 about working out our own salvation has nothing to do with salvation by works. It does, however, have everything to do with being so full of love and gratitude for our salvation that we'll cooperate with heaven in working for the salvation of others because we are saved. That actually makes a lot of sense. It's consistent, Dave. And that's what we've always got to remember. If we find an apparent contradiction, that's our red flag, that we need to keep digging because there's something we're not understanding there or some bigger truth here that we just need to dig out. Thanks for the question, Bekele, and I've learned a lot from this as well today. If you've got questions or comments, send us a message. Go to our website at worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. We really enjoy hearing from our listeners. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In his great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. 
Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, He declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining His kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to Him. If you're enjoying WLC Radio, invite your friends to listen in too. If you know someone interested in last day events or you have a Bible study partner, tell them about our website, worldslastchance.com. have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.